Ali, starting with the macroeconomic picture, rising interest rates has clearly been a headwind for technology stocks. Now attention has turned to when the Fed might cut and at what pace. What's your and the team's base case? We continue to expect um, moderate US growth next year and that inflation will continue to trend down to target and that will ultimately allow the Fed to cut. I think coming into the year, the market got a bit over its skis about when that might happen, um, looking for kind of six rate cuts or six 25 basis point rate cuts starting in March. Since then, we've had a, a hot Q4 GDP print in the US uh, coming in at 3.3% rather than 2%, which was expected. Uh, we've had um, pushback from the Fed themselves about when that might happen, including Powell saying he doesn't think a March cut is, is appropriate. And we've also had a hot or slightly hotter CPI and PPI print, which again just gives the Fed a little bit of pause. So the market's now, I think, at between three and four cuts this year, starting about June, um, which feels fairly reasonable to us. I think the, the key point from our perspective is that a environment where rates are coming down at, at whatever pace, um, inflation is moderating, but growth is low but positive, that's a pretty good environment for tech historically because of the scarcity that growth tech offers. Okay, now technology has had a strong uh, 2023 and a strong start to 2024, but it has been driven still by the mega cap stocks. When do you expect that to broaden out to other technology stocks? Uh, the mega cap question is, is an important one. And I think it's worth noting that the mega caps had a great 23, but they had a disastrous 22. And if you take the two years together, the Magnificent Seven, as they're now known, are only about 15 points ahead of the S&P. Um, and that just reflects a terrible 22 and a really strong 23. They have also delivered really strong earnings upgrades and cash flow estimates. And that is a reflection of strong execution, a bit of religion on cost cutting, and the fact that they are becoming increasingly well positioned for AI. And we think that's a really part, important part of that story. In terms of breadth, um, we as fund managers tend to be structurally underweight the mega caps because they are just so large in our benchmark, much as we've, we've liked uh, many of the stocks individually. We saw that something of an improvement in breadth towards the end of last year, um, as yields came back down to about 3.8% by, by the end of the year, actually where they started 2023, funnily enough. That is reversed slightly this year. Um, we've had yields go back up to kind of 4.2 or 4.25 on the 10 year, which creates a bit of a headwind for small and mid cap. Um, we have been changing the portfolio somewhat um, in favour of small and mid caps, where we find um, more exciting risk reward, frankly. A lot of that is in the new AI computing stack out in Taiwan and Japan and other areas. And we've been using some of the mega caps, um, particularly Google, particularly Apple, as a source of funds for that trade. Now, it's presumably been a challenge managing that concentration risk. You're seeing these large companies just get bigger and bigger. You know, how do you keep up with those, but at the same time manage the risk of not having too much exposure? Uh, we've been quite careful about it. And um, the fact is that these, com these mega cap companies are extraordinary assets. Uh, many of them are natural monopolies. They look incredibly well positioned for AI. They've delivered these earnings and cash flow upgrades. So the danger has always been to be too bearish on companies, these companies just because they've had a good run or, or they've had some good estimate revisions. The way we think about it um, further down market is where are the companies positioned for AI? So we go through every company we look at with an AI lens, as we call it, to try and work out where they're positioned for this new extraordinary technology um, in the form of generative AI. Well, picking up on AI, how do you distinguish between companies where AI will have a material impact on the share price and those where it might have a lesser or negligible impact? We have a very large team um, of 10 people who spend all of their time basically doing that. And uh, we are very fortunate to have had a lot of experience in this. So we launched an AI, a dedicated AI fund six years ago, um, run by Zhu Song Zhao, which has existed essentially to answer that question. So, so we've been looking at this and, and thinking about this for a long time. We've been pleasantly surprised, I think, by the, the pace of AI adoption and the pace at which things have become real. Um, because in tech, you get these hype cycles where, where everyone gets excited about new technology. But in practice, it takes a, a little bit longer than everyone thinks to come through to revenue, to come through to something you can actually invest against. That hasn't actually been the case with AI. We've seen very quick adoption. We've seen revenues turn up, NVIDIA most famously, but also all through the new AI computing stack supply chain. Um, and we've seen uh, a number of data points that give us a lot of confidence that we're at the beginning of a, of a really exciting trend in AI. OK, well, having had such a strong run, the Nasdaq's now nearly at all-time highs again. At what stage do you worry about exuberance? I think there are people making the case, obviously, that tech looks pretty fully valued at 1.45 times the S&P. And I see the argument that if you go post the 2008 crisis, tech is normally traded between 1.1 and 1.4 times. And we've now clearly broken out of that range. 
to us, that reflects the fact we are in a new paradigm. There will obviously be bumps on the, on the road to adoption and there will be setbacks um, and the, the path is, is never um, clear and never easy. But we think that the early data points for around AI have been very encouraging. Um, and a few examples of that, perhaps the most important is the fact that in Q4, all of the hyperscale players raised their CapEx expectations this year. And that was not expected. And they all did it for the same reason. They see massive opportunities in AI and they want to invest aggressively to win there. And we take note when the people with the most data and in many cases the smartest people in the room are all doing the same thing for the same reason. And we think that's a, a really important data point. Secondly, some of the early AI applications um, have been adopted quicker than any other in history. We've seen uh, ServiceNow talk about that. We've seen Microsoft talk about that. We've seen Adobe talk about that. Again, these things were questionable about how quickly people would adopt them, whether they pay for them. And it seems, at least from the early data, that they are paying for them and they are adopting them quicker than anything they have before. So that's quite exciting. At third, we've seen the IT services companies where we don't invest, but we certainly listen to what they say, talking about generative AI showing up in every client conversation, every client project. And finally, we've seen um, Microsoft's Azure cloud get six points of growth from generative AI versus three last quarter and one the quarter before. Absolutely exponential growth. Um, and that's been really, really interesting to see. And again, speaks to a technology that has arrived uh, and is sort of getting ready for prime time. Okay, so given all of that context, how has the trust performed over the past year? We've uh, performed pretty well. Um, we've been pleased with performance, um, both versus the bench and versus peers. And that really reflects the pivot we made in the portfolio last year to AI. Um, AI has been where investors have wanted to be, and we made that pivot last year. Um, the other thing that we benefited from is to make that pivot, we also sort of reduced or actually got out of some areas that have been a bit weaker, like electric vehicles, like clean tech, like China. Uh, it's not that we don't like those, those kind of trends longer term, it just feels that like AI risk reward at this stage, at the beginning of the adoption cycle, is, is just more interesting. Um, so that's helped too.